Hi, I'm Tom Temples again, and in this module we're going to discuss how do we recognize direct hydrocarbon indicators. One of the things we, in addition to being able to map structure on our seismic data, is a lot of times we can directly see the presence of hydrocarbons. So I want to give you some information on how to recognize the different types of hydrocarbon indicators and what they look like on seismic data. And I'm going to spend a couple of minutes talking about why we get direct hydrocarbon indicators. Um, when you replace your water or oil in your formation with gas, you significantly impact the velocity and density of the formation. So by increasing the contrast between the reservoir rock with the gas in it and the overlying shales, I get what's called a bright spot. And that's because there's so much of a drop in contrast, the reflection coefficient difference between the water wet sand and the gas wet sand and the overlying shale is really quite a bit different, which is a good thing. It gives us a really nice amplitude anomaly and we can see those seismic data. But part of the issue is, and why we have to be a little bit careful using direct hydrocarbon indicators, is if I replace water with only 5% of the gas saturation, I reduce the velocity of the formation almost in half which means a little bit of gas goes a long way. And it took the oil industry several years in the Gulf Coast to figure that out. And we drilled what we affectionately call fizz water wells. And it had the same effect of taking the, bottle off of, taking the cap off a bottle of Coca-Cola. You got a real big burst of gas. And then very quickly, the well depleted and went on. But I want to talk a little bit about those. One of the things we come up with, we see are bright spots. And as you can see on this slide here, I have a very high amplitude anomaly surrounded by low amplitude events. We see these quite often in the Gulf of Mexico. We also see them a lot in West Africa. Generally confined to areas where we have um, tertiary age sediments. So we see bright spots. We also, in addition to bright spots, can see things that are called dim spots. And these usually occur in rocks that are harder, Mesozoic, Paleozoic age, for example, and carbonates. And in this case, when we replace the water in the formation with the gas, the, it again lowers the velocity, but instead of increasing the velocity contrast between the overlying rock, it decreases it. So instead of getting a high amplitude event, we get a dim out. And as you can see on this section right here, you have a pretty bright event coming in. And when you get on top of the structure, it gets very dim and you come back the other side and the brightness picks back up again. And this creates kind of an interpreter's dilemma because our eye loves to follow high amplitude events. So in this case, we get to the bright, the dim spot and we tend to want to follow down and come back up. And we may miss the fact that there's a bright spot there altogether. If you look on this slide here, this is a time slice across the top of a structure. The red line indicates the structural closure, and within that you'll notice that the amplitude is significantly reduced from the surrounding areas, indicating that we're dealing with a gas cap across the top of the section. Now why do we get dim outs? Well, if you look at it, the reflection coefficient between the shale and the overlying brown sand can be fairly high. When you replace that with gas, you reduce the velocity of the sand to the point so that the reflection coefficient becomes significantly lower. And where you hit that interface, you go from a very strong peak to sometimes a complete reversal in polarity and end up with a trough across the top of the event. So not only can we get complete dim outs, we can also see just a reduction in amplitude as well. We can also get flat spots on our seismic data and here's an example, you look at this thing, I have three examples of flat spot. Here's your amplitude anomaly right here and then running across that is a flat spot indicating the gas water contact. On this image we see an anticlinal structure with a nice bright spot across the top of it and then down in the structure we see the flat spot itself. So these are some pretty characteristic things. In this case, this one's a little bit more subtle on this slide. You see you've got the event coming down, very high amplitude, and then all of a sudden the event turns flat, and then as you go out the other side, we see the dipping event, but the amplitude is significantly less. In this case, this is our bright spot here. Here is our flat spot showing the contact, and this is where we go back into the water column. 
You can also see a flat spot on this data set as well. Not all flat spots are gas water contacts. In this slide you see an example from offshore Greenland in which you have a very prominent, you have dipping events, a nice fault or erosional contact here that sets up what we think is a trap, and we have a flat spot coming across the data set right here. Turns out this flat spot has nothing to do with the presence of gas and everything in the world to do with a transformation from cryptocrystalline quartz to crystalline quartz. So it's a pressure boundary that affects the mineralogy. So take your amplitude anomalies with a grain of salt. The other thing a lot of times we see in the seismic data that indicates we have the presence of hydrocarbons are velocity sags. And you can see in this example here we have a, several events that are pretty flat going across and you pick up this zone of very high amplitude indicating more than likely a bright spot and then if you look at this event right under it when you get near that amplitude anomaly this event sags in time as well as this deeper event and that sag is due to the replacement of a lot of your fluid with gas that reduces the velocity in this overall section of the rock and creates a time anomaly underneath it. Some parts of the world you get things like gas chimneys and in this example you can see a gas chimney and so you've got fairly decent data coming into it and all of a sudden you hit this zone of no data that looks washed out. And this is a result of this structure here which you can't see because of the gas chimney leaking and leaking hydrocarbons up into the overlying sediments which wipe out your P wave signal. Now here's a cross section showing the structure across that that in a D is an anticline. Here's the seismic section and you see you can't see that there's an anticline there. But well, one of the techniques you can use to s determine whether or not there is a true structure is there is if you remember all the way back to module one we discussed the difference between P and S waves we said that P waves affect see both the rock and the fluid properties where the shear waves only see the rock properties if I look at the P wave data I see this area where I have no inter no reflectors through there but if I look down here at the bottom on this X component this is a shear wave line the gas doesn't affect the shear wave signal and I can see the presence of the structure there so it's just an extra tool that you can use if you're working in an area where you see gas chimneys a lot to help you resolve what's going on. We also have gas hydrates and these occur usually in fairly deep water and what happens there is because of the temperature and pressure regime the methane actually turns into an ice form and you get these really strong events that are down in the section and a lot of times they're called bottom simulating reflectors because they parallel the ocean bottom and a lot of times they're confused as a multiple of the ocean bottom and it turns out one of the techniques you use to determine that is if you measure the time distance between the surface and the ocean floor and you look at a multiple of that if it's a a multiple of the ocean bottom it'll be at a repeatable interval well if you look at this event here this distance is not a repeatable interval of that which gives you a clue that it's really a bottom simulating reflector one of the techniques that came out of bright spots was AVO or amplitude variation with offset and it turned out to be a very very powerful tool the original work was done by a couple of guys named Rutherford and Williams and they came up with essentially three classifications you have class one class two and class three AVO anomalies the difference between how we analyze for AVO and other seismic techniques is instead of looking at the gather in other words where we take all the traces and sum them together to do AVO we look at the gather itself so we look at the difference between the reflectors on the traces that are narrow angles versus what the reflectors look like at far angles and if you can look at this figure here this is a, a class 3 AVO anomaly and what happens is when I put gas in the reservoir the reflector on both the top and the bottom of the sand increase in amplitude as I move from near traces to far traces. When there is no gas in there we expect the signal to get go from higher amplitude to lower amplitude. So what I'm looking for and I'm looking for an AVO anomaly is a change in that signal with relationship to near and far. 
If I have a class two ABO anomaly, what happens with that is as I approach the mid angle, my polarity of my data will change from positive to negative or negative to positive, um, which makes it look makes it really very interesting to see. And if you think about it, what happens if I take that gather and sum it together into a single trace? I really have no reflector there because I'm canceling it out. So a lot of times on uh, class two AB anomalies, my reservoir will not be visible at all on my stack section, but stands out quite nicely on an AVO plot. Here's an example of, of, of class three AVO anomaly, and this is what it, the reflector looks like when the zone is wet. I see my amplitude starts out fairly strong, and as I move through angle of incidence from zero to 40 degrees, it diminishes quite significantly. Conversely, if I take that same formation and replace it with gas, if I look at this event here, I start out with an amplitude that gradually increases with angle of incidence. So it makes it fairly easy to differentiate between wet gas and dry gas. And there are a lot of other techniques that I can use to, to map that with, but essentially the base, basic thing I want to do is I want to take my original stack and I want to divide it up into near and fars and plot those and see what they look like. Here's an example of that where the upper figure is my near stack, the, far, the lower figure is my far stack, and you'll notice through the zone of interest there's a significant change in amplitude. So by just looking at the change between nears and fars and knowing based on the model that I should see increase of amplitude where gas is present on the far stacks, I can see that I have no gas here because there's very little change between the near and far, but across this part of the structure there's a significant change in amplitude, so I can see the presence of gas there. These are just some of the additional techniques that we can use to help differentiate whether we have a pay zone or is that increase in amplitude that we see as a bright spot really more a reflection of change in lithology. Thank you for joining us today and I hope to see you sometime later on in one of our classes.